You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Lauren Keith. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Business Essentials for Authors is your Business 101 guide for the publishing industry. Whether you've never published at all or are looking to take your professional career up a notch in an easy-to-read and conversational way, the book covers the five pillars of business. We look at all of this and more from a long-term strategic view, how to get the plan done, and the mindset to make it all work. Business Essentials for Writers, How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book one by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to four, that's the number four, thewords.com. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the seat in the chair, hand on keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off 
a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. Thanks for tuning in today. We've got a great show coming up for you. I want to give you a heads up before this episode starts. The audio quality is not as fidelity as it normally is. We had a death in the family about a week or so ago, and uh, in the midst of that, I was supposed to record with Lauren, and I wound up recording this in my car over the phone uh, because I didn't want to miss this uh, this great conversation that we had. So just want to apologize up front. The audio is not up to normal standards, but the conversation is amazing. So I hope you guys enjoy it, and stay tuned afterward for an audiobook clip uh, from Lauren's new book. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Lauren Kate on the show with me today. She has a brand new book called The Orphan Song, and it's out available everywhere in audiobook uh, and Kindle and hardcover and any way that you consume books, you can grab The Orphan Song. It's a fantastic book. I think you guys are really going to love it. Welcome to the show, Lauren. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you. Uh, Lauren, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Uh, when I was in seventh grade, I had a very terrifying English teacher. Um, she had bright red curly hair, and she wore these really pointy red stiletto heels, and she drove a tiny little red convertible, and she was, um, you know, this very, very hard on her students. She treated us um, like adults in a way that I had never been treated before, and she expected quite a lot of us, and um, she assigned us a two-year journal writing, journal-keeping project that at the end of which we would mail to her, and um I filled up that I filled up two full journals over the course. You know, this is seventh and eighth grade, so I had quite a lot of angst to, to put down <laughs> on the page. And um, I remember um, we gave, we turned them in at the end of the eighth grade year, and I went off to summer camp. And I remember coming home and having um, a package in my room, and it was my journals mailed back to me. I had written so much, uh, kind of with this teacher in mind as an audience. Um, stories I had made up that were true to my life, but embellished, um, you know, a story that something that had happened to me that was embarrassing that I rewrote in my mind and for this teacher so that I became the hero, you know, instead of the, the dork, right? And um, I thought that she was going to write me back something quite substantial, I guess, because I had put so much effort into writing to her. And when I opened up the package and I flipped to the back of my second journal, um, she had written me two sentences, um, and she said, Lauren, you are an enigma. Keep writing. <laughs> and no one had ever told me to keep writing before, and it's funny how simple that is, but coming from someone who meant so much to me, it was all I needed to keep going. Uh, I had to look up what enigma meant, but once I realized that this teacher who, to me, was so such a force and so mysterious, she thought that I possessed that same mysterious quality, and I had shown that to her via my writing, uh, it became the only thing I wanted to do after that. Yeah, that is amazing. We we talk so much on the show about uh, early influences and uh, early encouragements because, you know, the, the life of a writer can be very uh, cloistered and lonely and, uh, you know, with, with little feedback until you get all the feedback. Uh, you know, all at once. And, you know, some of those dark days, uh, it, you know, we, we cling to those, uh, early encouragements. And, 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 you know, those, those two lines didn't cost her anything, yet you have built a writing career on it. Yeah, it's amazing. I recently reached out to her and, and told her this story. And, um, I, she wrote back to me almost immediately, you know, within a couple of minutes, she had written me back and she said you know, she was going to file this email away for days when she was feeling blue and I, I think that um, it's it's hard to know the effect that we can have on other people so I was, I was she meant so much to me I was glad to finally get to tell her how much she meant uh, so having this this newfound uh, confidence in uh, and uh, validation maybe um, wh what did you do with that did you continue writing and did you f have a newfound purpose in the writing 
I definitely continued writing, um, but I would say I, I didn't grow up in a family that knew how to support creative work as something outside of like what a child does. Um, my family, my family, are, we're all big readers, but I didn't grow up knowing any artists. I didn't know, I certainly didn't know any writers. I didn't know any painters or musicians. I didn't know anyone who had a creative job for their work. And so it was always presented to me like, oh yeah, that's what you do now, but eventually you'll, you'll grow up and grow out of this and get a real job. Um, so I, I think I assumed that that would happen to me. And I went to college, um, planning to follow in my brother's footsteps and, I don't know, become a lawyer. You know, I was studying politics very <laughs> mistakenly. And um, I, I stumbled on a creative writing class that I applied for kind of when I was miserable and, you know, doing terribly in all my other classes. And it, it became this kind of refuge and sanctuary. And I remember the first day the professor just holding up a copy very nonchalantly of his new book and, you know, there was his name on it and there was his picture on the flap and he made it so real, not to say he ever suggested it was easy, but he, you know, just said, I, I'm i a human being. I wake up and have oatmeal for breakfast and then I get to work and this is my this is my work. Um, that it could be so simple was not something I ever had been exposed to before and, um, you know, I think I I became a lot more serious about making it happen uh, at that point. And then, of course, it took me another, you know, 10 years of constant rejection almost right. before I got anything published. So what was uh, what was the first thing that you did get published? Um, I, th I think I published a few short stories here and there in very small journals, but I certainly, and I still have, a shoebox of rejection letters, you know, back in the day when you used to get a physical right. paper rejection. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you have a lot of writers talking about this, but the, the degrees of the rejection letter, the good rejection letters versus the, the great rejection letters versus the totally anonymous, like, you know, dear writer, yeah, you might as well just go die, <laughs> right? Right. Um, and I, I remember I used to call my mom and say, I got a really good rejection letter. They put my name on it and they wrote something nice about my book. And, you know, she just said, it's still a rejection letter, isn't it? Why are you so excited? Um, but again, like you said, just those little moments of encouragement, that would keep me going for another six months, the good rejection letter. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you what, a good rejection letter sometimes is more valuable long term uh, than, uh, than an acceptance on a book that's not ready. And, uh, you know, sure, someone who yeah. will tell you the honest truth, but it constructively, um, it, I, I yeah. think it's way more valuable. Yeah. So, so, so that's why writers get excited about stuff like that is that, you know, someone, someone sees something in my work and wants to help me with the craft. That's, that's amazing. Absolutely. You, uh, you write, uh, the, you have a, a number of books out and uh, you, are sort of varied in your writing interest. Uh, what was the when you start thinking of a story? What is what's the first thing that usually comes to you? And and do you have a default uh, genre that uh, that Lauren Kate kind of lives in? Uh, is that a a misnomer uh, about writers uh, that that we kind of default to a certain style, a certain genre, uh, and things like that? I think it's tr I think that. Every writer has his or her own obsessions and preoccupation. Um, and maybe it manifests in genre, maybe it manifests in, in writing style. Um, for me, it manifests in, in topics that I revisit again. Um, and for me, it's love. I mean, it's, it's erotic love and relationships and the things that we learn and the people that we become in and out of these relationships. Um, so I have written a lot of different kinds of things. I've written a lot for young adults. I've written speculative um, fantasy and science fiction. Now I'm writing historical fiction. But I think there is um, a difficult and kind of emblematic love story at the heart of each of my um, books that pushes the characters in ways that nothing else could push them, which is kind of the thing that I'm always looking for when I'm reading a story is to see a character go through something monumental and, and see what happens to them on the other side of it. Um, and I find the vehicle for that that interests me the most, in my own writing at least, is, is love. Well, the genre ten, tends to be kind of window dressing on the story. What we all show up for is 
seeing the you know the human condition and the the human heart in conflict with itself and with others and and we yeah. uh, you, you know we're, it's the same we're all looking for the same kind of story we just dress it up differently yeah exactly i think um you know i do think that people come to stories for different reasons but the reason i come to stories and i think the reason a lot of people do is to be made to feel something right. um and it can be just it can just be to be made to laugh a little bit or you know i think I happen to love a good tearjerker, but I want to be surprised by the intensity of a feeling that, you know, a character very much unlike me can evoke. In. Right. Um, I know your new book, uh, The Orphan Song, um, has a, a very specific origin story, and I want to ask you about that in just a minute. Um, but do, do books usually start like that for you? Is it, uh, it like, what's the kernel of the, of the idea that a story usually grows from? It's probably a, a question that I want to answer, um, a tension that I can see somewhere that um, I can imagine a character struggling with something. Um, so, for example, for my first um, novel, Fallen, um, which is a series about fallen angels kind of interacting with mortal uh, mortal women, there, I was um, in graduate school. I was studying um, the Bible as literature, so kind of reading, the, you know, Genesis like it's the Great Gatsby. And um, the first day of class, I was looking at this line in Genesis that talks about the sons of God. So these are the angels uh, looking down from heaven and seeing mortal women, um, the, the daughters of man, and finding them beautiful. And Yes, the exactly. Bethlehem chapter, yeah. Lots of yeah, fantasy um, writers have that has inspired lots and lots of fantasy. Yeah, yeah, and and my professor said that a lot of scholars think that this moment where the angels put something above God or before God is the reason that the angels had to fall. Um, so I was thinking about that sacrifice, you know, just just really, really, it's lust, but you know, I would turn it into love. Um, that that would be enough for an angel to give up everything um, about place in heaven and his role in the universe. That the sacrifice there seemed to me the thing I wanted to explore. I love that, and it, it's so interesting to me that we can so many people can share a similar catalyst. Um, you know that that one or two lines in, in you know in a twenty five hundred year old book or so uh, you know inspires people to. It, it's created all kinds of stories that are completely different and, and uh, yeah. were informed and jump started from this one place. But, you know, the writer's imagination is, is completely different and unique. And I, I love that you have a completely different take than, than I would have. Uh, how many books did that, yeah. did that spawn? That became, let me see, six books. Yeah. But I had quite a lot to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what about writing for YA? What, how is that different for you? You know, the thing that I think it's interesting because this, my new book, The Orphan Song, the characters also begin at, you know, 16 or 17. Right. And, um, yet they are able to, because, it, because of the era in which it's set, it's set in the 18th century in Venice, they're able to kind of grow up a bit more quickly than certainly like a teenager in America today, um, they're able to have a full life experience over the next five or ten years, um, with includes marriage and children and all of that stuff. Um, I think that the thing that separates YA fiction from adult fiction is is only um, that YA fiction has to be limited, and I, I don't mean that in like a pejorative sense. I mean um, just in a in a necessary sense, limited to something that a, a teenage reader today would be interested in. So that means, yes, these characters in, in YA fiction, they have parents, certainly, and they have family members that have their own worlds outside of them, but you're not going to read about the mother's, um, you know, fears and hopes and dreams. You're only focused on, you know, the, the narcissism of the teen experience. And I think um, that's really beautifully immersive for a teen reader or, you know, for any reader to just be stuck so close on the interests 
and the viewpoint of a teenager. But that, that to me is really the only difference between teen fiction and, and something that's not teen fiction. Um, I, don't, I think the, the depth of characterization and the, the story arcs can be as um, exciting and profound. It's just you, you might look through a wider lens if you're not writing for teen. Gotcha. Um, I'd, like you said, that uh, it's, it's naturally um, limited, and, and I think that scares a lot of people that you know, I don't want to be stifled. I don't want to work within these bounds. Um, when you kind of get past that in your head and um, and get in the mind, if you will, of the reader, um, do you find that it gets easier? And and are there tools that you use to um, uh, to shift gears and to start thinking uh, so that you can write in a way that doesn't feel stifling to you? It's just the freedom of writing, like you do any other thing. Yeah, I mean, I think you can, I would, I would look at it when I was writing YA fiction as a kind of gift. It's like, um, I'm trying to think of a metaphor. You know, it's like the freedom of having a school uniform or something. It, it frees you up if you don't have to, to worry about, um, this other variety of things. It frees you up to really focus your energy when you wake up in the morning on, this, this precise story and this precise character's point of view. I mean, I think a lot of um, what I'm always working on in first drafts and, and getting wrong in first drafts is not not showing enough of the main character's point of view and emotional experience. So if you can kind of uh, dim the lights everywhere else and just have a spotlight on that character, um, it, it's a it's a great way to start writing. Gotcha. The the new book, um, a, as you mentioned, is a is a departure from the stuff that you normally do uh, in writing historical fiction. Uh, there are again um, kind of boundaries that you have to work within when you're writing speculative, and you know you're talking about fallen angels and things like that. Um, you uh, you're pretty free to paint the canvas pretty much any way that you want within certain bounds. Uh, but you know the canvas is yours. When you're talking about historical fiction, um, these are actual places, actual times, actual events that you have to work within. Um, before we talk about the, the craft of writing uh, historical fiction, where did this story idea come from? Uh, I was in Venice um, probably about three or four years ago on a book tour for another book, and um, I got lost, as you are, must do when you're in Venice. <laughs> And um, I was wandering past this formidable building called the Hospital of the Incurable. And the name just struck me. Uh, it sounded very romantic and very doomed. And I wanted to know who these incurables were and what the story behind this big building was. And so I did a little bit of research and I discovered that it was um, for about 500 years and during the Venetian Republic, it was an orphanage for foundling children who were trained by the church to sing and play music. Uh, it became like the world's original music conservatory. And the musicians that were trained there became the most famous, almost like rock stars of their day. People would travel from all over the world to see these orphan girls sing. It was like a stop on the grand tour that wealthy um, Englishmen would take. They would go to the Vatican they would go to Rome to see the Vatican, they would go to Florence to see the David, and then they would go to Venice to hear the orphan. And um, I I learned a lot about how these girls were trained and, you know, what they were reaching for, you know, what they were aspiring to in these choirs, um, which were kind of to, t to take an orphan child and turn them into, you know, the most celebrated musician of their day is already really fascinating, but what what struck me was this oath that the girls had to sign when they joined the choir, um, basically signing their lives away to the church and saying they would never, ever sing anywhere outside or, or play music outside of the walls of the church. Um, so, of course, I'm, I'm thinking about who's the little rebel who can't stand this restriction, and she's got to break out of this, you know, both rise to prominence and become the most celebrated musician and then say, no thanks, I'm out of here, you know, and, and what does life have in store for her after that? 
Well, it's so dark, uh, and it, all the glamour and the the recognition and all that, and the 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 underside of that is, you know, like the Eagle song, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so it's so crazy. We we can't imagine that. Um, how as you start peeling back the layers of this story, um, how does the the research go for a book like this? And this was really delightful research because, you know, I had this idea that I knew I wanted to. I knew there was a story in The Incurables, but I didn't know what it was. And about a year after I got the idea, I, I was ready to tackle the research. So I went back to Venice. I spent 10 days with Venetian historians and Venetian musicians and the the keepers of these orphanages' artifacts. And I, you know, I got to touch the cloaks that they used to wear and see the, um, they had these things called half tokens, which were like a painting or something that was shorn in half. And when a mother abandoned her child, she would keep half and give the child half so that, you know, if fate ever reunited them, this was the proof that they had, that they had this bond. Um, And, you know, I just looked at this case of hundreds and hundreds of half tokens that were never made whole, you know, reunions that never happened. But you could imagine all of the the hope and the longing that would go into a young child holding on to this thing, just dreaming maybe one day I'll find the other half. That is that's heartbreaking and and beautiful at yeah. the same time. That's uh, wow. Um, you mentioned that the the first thing you start thinking about is uh, is finding that rebel. Um, tell me about Violetta and and Mino and and how does. How does the, the human story of this story start coming about? Yeah, um, so Violetta is the, she's the female protagonist in the story, and she's uh, extremely gifted and um, quite quickly assumes the, the role of one of the, the, she's a soprano and becomes, you know, the first, the main singer, star, who sings the arias in the uh, choral performances. Um, and she has a real physical need to get out of Venice, um, to inhabit a life where no one knows she was ever abandoned. Uh, this this kind of identity as an orphan, as an undesirable, haunts her and hangs over her, uh, and she she must get out. Um, Mino is kind of the opposite in some ways. He is not a musician. The boys were not trained to... Um, do much of anything besides they they were fed and clothed and then when they reached a certain age they got an apprenticeship somewhere in the city and kind of you know disappeared into the anonymity of um, a lower class Venetian life. Um, but Mino, ha- he, he is different from the other orphans in this story because he was abandoned quite late. He was five years old when his mother um, left him, so he has memories of her and he has an understanding that there is there was some foul play behind his abandonment, that it was not his mother's choice, that there's a secret that if he could just uncover it, he could be reunited with her. Um, because it's not that she didn't want him. It's that something drove her to have to save his life by putting him in the care of the church. And so um, He's a luthier, his right? journey... I'm sorry? He's a luthier, right? He is, yes. He becomes a, a luthier and, and makes his own violin. So even after the two of these characters both uh, step outside their their very cloistered lives in the orphanage, um, they're they're both looking for two different things. Um, and of course, um, th- this is also a time when everybody in Venice is wearing masks almost all the time. Um, so they're disguised from one another. Even as they're looking for each other in the story, they m- might pass each other 20 times on 20 different bridges, but they're masked, so they never know it. Um, so the story is kind of a cat and mouse chase told from alternating points of view as they look for each other and as they look for their own, you know, redemptive, uh, you know, they're, as they're on their own quest. Um, and the chapters get shorter and shorter and the, the space between them gets smaller and smaller until they finally reunite in this kind of crescendo chapter where the alternating points of view um, dissolve and they're both telling the same story for once. It's it's an amazing uh, achievement, the, the structure of the book, and I'm glad you brought that out because it, it does, it ramps up and, and you get, 
uh, it it's a uh, it's a palpable feeling as you're reading it that the that the the speed is picking up and that you are you're pushing us forward as we chase them you know down the uh, the, the alleyways and the streets of Venice. It's it's crazy. Um, was that an idea that you had early on? Did you know that the structure of the book was going to go that way? No, it actually surprised me and, and dismayed me at first because I didn't understand why it was happening. Um, I you know. I wrote at the beginning, these chapters are, are longer and you spend more time with each character before you move to the other one. And as I got further along, I would think, you know, I'm sitting down to write, you know, a 25 page chapter. Why did I finish it in 12? And why did I finish the next one in six? Why, you know, why don't I, I'm supposed to have more to say about this, but I'm so eager to get to switch and get to the other one to kind of tell their version of that day where they, where they passed each other that, um, it, it it felt very musical to me. It felt like um, the shape of a violin concerto, where the pacing suddenly picks up and you're you're made to feel something very different than the you know the previous piece where you were quite relaxed and in the the languid slow legato phrasing. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think in revision I was able to look at this and say, oh, this is a this is a symphony, this right. book. But at, as I was drafting it, I was thinking, what's wrong with me? <laughs> It's so much fun when the book becomes alive and and becomes the thing it's going to be and and yeah, it know, becomes very disobedient. It does, and then you're you're just like okay, I'm I'm at the I'm at the mercy of of the whim right. of the book. Here we go. I surrender. Yeah, I surrender. That's, I love it. The book is called The Orphan Song, and it is out available everywhere now. Um, Lauren, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into your back catalog and follow along with news coming up and all that good stuff, uh, where can they find you online? Uh, my website is laurenkatebooks.net, and I am all over the social media. You can find me, Lauren Kate Books, on Twitter and Instagram, and I'm Lauren Kate Author, I think, on Facebook. Um, yeah, I'm out there. Excellent. We're going to put links to all that in the show notes. And listeners, if you will stick around for a minute, we're going to play an audiobook clip from The Orphan Song and it's coming right up in just a minute. Uh, Lauren, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Thanks for listening to this episode of Author Stories. Go to hankgarner.com to find all of the archives of the show, and be sure to subscribe while you're there. In a northern notch of the Adriatic Sea, beyond allegiance to Byzantium or Rome, a thousand-year-old empire was sinking. No one noticed her descent, disguised by centuries of wealth and reputation, like her citizens, living each day behind their carnivale masks. See them in their gondolas, lovers lifting disguises beneath bridges to kiss. Imagine the senator making his vote anonymously in the halls of the doge's palace, and the little girl at the market buying artichokes with her mama the black ribbon of her mask whipping in a summer wind. In the years before the Republic fell, this was the Venetian way, to make a mystery of everything, to obscure identity in life, never to look too closely at what lay underneath. For a thousand years, Venice had glittered at the center of the trading world, jewel of the Mediterranean. But when the trade routes shifted, and with them went the gold, she misheard her swan song as the music of celebration. She feasted more riotously than ever. Venice had always been sinking. Why not don the masks another day and toast another pink sunset? Except in the churches and the hospitals, where masks were forbidden. Most days, the city's sick and the city's orphans, those wards of the church, were the only bare faces in Venice. This story begins in an orphanage, on a lonesome night in the sleepy neighborhood of Dorso Duro. There, in a nursery for foundling children, a five-year-old girl lay in bed planning her escape. Winter had the city in its grip again, and a driving wind rattled the pane of the window with its sad view of the building next door. Even if Violetta pressed against its glass, the most she could see was a curtained window through which no one ever looked out. As soon as the others fell asleep, 
she would steal to the attic. Behind crates of old vestments and broken violins, its sole high window cleared the neighboring rooftop. She could see how Venice stretched to the horizon. She could be alone. She waited for the last whispers to fade to breathing, for the extraordinary stillness of three dozen sleeping girls. She had a trick for keeping patient. She explored the streets of Venice in her mind. She traveled up and down her city's bridges, blinking at the trembling gold reflection of the sun on the canal. If she focused, she could almost smell the water's brine. Four times had she been allowed beyond the orphanage walls, to walk the stone streets in a line of orphans taking alms, chanting, and invoking saints. Violetta held fast to those memories. Gondoliers crooning, street performers throwing knives and swallowing fire, sidestepping white-masked noblemen and women, so unlike the barefaced orphans that they might have been another species. How she longed to wear a mask. The walks always ended the same way, with the prioress turning the girls back to the Zattere, the sunny stone promenade slapped by the Judeca Canal. Then they hurried past the Traghetto stop, where gondoliers whistled beneath the brims of their straw hats. They passed the entrance to the building's west wing, the sculpted head of a foundling boy marking the door of the male dormitory. They passed the central double doors, the public entrance, which opened to a high-ceilinged vestibule that led directly into the church. And then, too soon, they were back at the east wing, where the corresponding sculpted head of a foundling girl hung over the entrance of the only home Violetta had ever known. In her imagination, this was the moment she broke free, took off running down the narrow calle, ducking past street hawkers until she found herself gloriously alone, until she wasn't an orphan anymore. In her mind, she was clattering across a stone bridge wearing the painted wooden high-heeled clogs of a patrician lady. She was masked. She was boarding a gondola, wind dancing with her cloak. She was sailing for Giudecca, for a masquerade at one of the stately palazzi across the canal. Or maybe she was going farther. Where? How much more was there to this city, to life, than she had been allowed to see? Beneath her covers, Violetta ran her thumb along her right heel, where the thin blue eye branded her award of the incurables. This mark told the universe that she had no family, that she belonged nowhere but here within this walled Istrian stone compound at the southern edge of the city.